let's move on to our, our next speaker, who is Hugh Faller. Uh, so he's a PhD student at the uh, Université Paris-Saclay. He did his uh, undergraduate at ENS, and he told me he has a permanent email address from the ENS, which is uh, uh, amazing. Uh, so uh, Ug is interested in turbulence, and he he's both a theoretician and computational fluid dynamicist, and he's very interested in comparing computational and experimental models. And today he's going to talk to us about uh, intermittency in turbulence. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk at this fluid mechanics webinar series. I'm very proud to be able to present you today my work. So I'm going to talk to you about a uh, work that is very much linked to the Bachelor uh, 100 meeting. Uh, so to celebrate the centenary of the Bachelor. Uh, and um, so my work is to uh, study the nature of intermittency in a turbulent flow. And I'm going to start first by uh, trying to, by citing a Bachelor and Townsend uh, that in uh, 49, uh, they tried to publish uh, an experimental uh, paper uh, trying to uh, verify uh, the turbulence, the Kolmogorov 41 theory. And so uh, they observed some uh, little inconsistencies looking at this quantity uh, inside the flow, which is alpha of n, uh, which is just uh, the ratio of the fourth moment of the derivative with the second moment to the square. And so they observed something that, uh, which was not expected, that this quantity uh, increases both with n and Reynolds. And so they measured this, um, these quantities in two geometries, one wind tunnel in Cambridge, and also it's a, a cylinder wake. Just showing you an image from a flow visual dot org. And so they they tried to uh, summarize their. Um, they are postulates in uh, this paragraph, which I like a lot. And so they, they found that there were isolated regions of uh, parts of the flow, which is very much activated with large wave numbers. Uh, in, and, uh, and it will be close to other regions that are more quiet. And so inside the flow, we have the coexistence of these two uh, parts. So that's a very interesting point. And also, as I just told you before, they were looking at the increase of this uh, uh, alpha of n and the way they would just look at smaller and smaller scales and larger wave numbers is by increasing the order of the derivative to take into account smaller smaller length gradients and uh, one of the explanations uh, about this inconsistency that was observed is that uh, either uh, this was linked to strong vortices and uh, vortex dynamics or that the homogeneity, uh, non-homogeneity, is maintained by the action of energy transfers. And uh, that's what I'm going to try to uh, look uh, closer today. So I'm going to try to answer these three questions. The first one is, uh, do we have self-similarity inside the flow uh, to study this non-homogeneity? Then uh, what is the origin of this non-homogeneity? Because you will see uh, very fast that there is some. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I would try to study the links uh, between the, the vortices, uh, the vorticity and energy transfers inside the turbulent flow. And uh, what is very interesting today is that we can use uh, very recent tools uh, to uh, be a bit more precise than what uh, Bachelor and Townsend observed. So uh, today we are going to study the flow, uh, von Kármán flow that we have in Saclay. So it's a flow inside a, si a cylinder. And you have two impropellers uh, propelling the fluid, and we get a very, very turbulent flow in a small geometry. And uh, I'm going to compare a very, very well resolved uh, direct numerical simulations uh, of this flow. So you have here a slice uh, with also experimental data of particular image velocimetry measurements. Uh, so these both are instantaneous fields. And uh, I will uh, keep uh, going, uh, comparing uh, DNS and the uh, experiments in this talk. And uh, this experiment is a measurement of almost the whole tank. And some of them were only measured in the very central region. Because it will be important later, you will understand why. And so uh, these are the very quickly the data sets that we have. Uh, we have five uh, PIV measurements in 2D, so on a plane, uh, three. PIV measurements in 3D, which are a bit better resolved, 
and uh, 3D components. And also, of course, this DNS that, I, that is very, very well resolved and takes into account the whole tank. And um, so uh, I'm going to need a bit of definitions today. Uh, so we use, uh, I use the wavelet um, theory uh, to define the wavelet velocity increments, which is a bit more precise than just the derivative of velocity field. So we just take a kind of a wavelet gradient of u. So if u is the velocity field, I define this gij as just a filtered gradient uh, with a wavelet of the velocity field. And uh, yeah, just need a filter phi. And then I define my velocity increments uh, as a delta w of l, uh, which is l times the maximum value of the, uh, this gij function that depends on x and l. And so it should be like uh, this delta w is more or less l times the gradient of the filtered field. And uh, we're going we're gonna to use this filtered uh, velocity increments, this wavelet velocity increments, to study the properties of uh, these uh, SP, which are just uh, structure functions. And uh, so it's kind of the order of derivatives that was looking, uh, Bachelor and Tonson looked at, but we're going to look at several P and not only four and two. And so one parallel that we have is that while they would increase n in the alpha n, they would look at larger wave number. And for, for me in a scale space, it's a smaller L. So n increases, uh, it's like L decreases. And so uh, the first thing we can check is, uh, but is the, if the flow is self-similar, then uh, yes, we will, you will see that in the inertial range, we have a polynomial relationship between this uh, structure function and the length. And the first thing we can check is look at if uh, the flow is similar to see that uh, this exponents zeta of p should go like a, a linear function of p. And we'll check that right now. So how we do we do so? Uh, the first thing we can do is I plot you on the left-hand side. Uh, it's the third uh, structure function. And you see that in the inertial range, uh, so from the Kolmogorov length to way larger, uh, we have just a, a, st a straight line in log log. So we have this exponent 0 0.8. And uh, if you compute that for several p's, then we can get access to this zeta of p for every uh, lots of different p. And I show you on the right hand side. Uh, so these stars, they are just the results of the 2D experiments. And uh, the black, uh, the red uh, squares are 3D experiments, and the blue points, blue circles are DNS. And you see here that uh, this relationship of delta p depending on p is not a straight line. So it seems that you know, the, the flow is not uh, self similar. And uh, this is the phenomenon of intermittence that we are going to try to understand. And uh, so the second question is where does this phenomenon comes from? And uh, one of the two hypotheses that were proposed uh, was the uh, origin the influence of the vorticity. And so this was already studied by Chenet, Abri, and Pinton. And so what they did uh, is that they used conditional statistics uh, to uh, restrict uh, structure functions on areas where they are uh, either strong or small uh, vorticity according to a threshold. And the result is on the right hand side here. If you take the whole signal, you have the curved line that as we observed just before, uh, if we take only the stronger uh, vorticity part, then it's even more intermittent. It's even further on than the straight line. And if we take the opposite, only small vorticity part, then uh, they have recovered uh, the straight line. So it seems that uh, the explanation by the vorticity threshold seems to be a good explanation for this phenomenon. But it was not the only one proposed. There was also the energy transfers that were uh, evocated, postulated by uh, Bachelor and Thompson. And some, we are gonna just need to introduce what exactly is an energy transfer. So if you use again the wavelengths function, uh, we can derive an energy budget for the Nagy Stokes equation. And so this is kind of an, uh, a kinetic filtered energy, a uh, yeah, filter kinetic energy. And so if you make the whole budget, uh, you find that there are two, there are two uh, ways of variation, two terms. The first one, it comes from the non-linear linear term. So it's kind of an energy transfer, giving energy through scales. And the second one is just the effect of the viscosity inside the flow. And so a bit like what uh, Chanet, Chanet, Abri, and Panton did on vorticity, uh, Dubreuil uh, tried uh, the same 
threshold method uh, on this energy transfer. And so if you take the whole signal, then you get the, the green points here that are just not on the line. And if you restrict on small values of the energy transfers according to a threshold, then we recover the straight line. So um, now we are, I'm going to show you something uh, going a bit more deep into this uh, phenomenon. So uh, using this, this very large data set that we have, uh, we've been able to compute uh, scaling exponents on uh, conditioned values of the vorticity of the energy transfer. And so I show you a map here. So it's just that uh, we have so much uh, velocity increments and in a large data set that we can compute uh, all the zeta uh, p uh, depending on the value that we have uh, for a certain energy transfer. And so we recover the expected result that is uh, we are decaying from the straight line for the, the mean value. So this is centered reduced uh, energy transfer. And so for the mean value, we recover the intermittency phenomenon that we expected. But now, uh, if we go to a large uh, energy transfer, be careful, it's in the opposite direction. If we go to very, very large energy transfers, then uh, we even get a very, very strong uh, deviation from this P over three line that was the expected one because we have even a negative slope. And it's the same even if we go in the very negative energy transfer. So going back to larger scales, we also have a lesser slope. And uh, so it's even more intermittent. So we have here a very strong result that energy transfer, they contribute to reduce, uh, to, to give uh, another value of this uh, theta of W and so uh, theta of P. And this is a very strong explanation of this intermittence. And so uh, what we would like to know here more precisely is if these two phenomena, vorticity and energy transfer are implied uh, in this phenomenon of, vorticity, of uh, intermittence, what are the links? Well, we're gonna study the links between the two of them and uh, see uh, with our data sets how, uh, if we can explain something or at least see something. So the first naive thing we can do is check, look, look at the, uh, visualizations of the of the flow. So here I show you inside an experimental uh, cut uh, slice. We see on the left hand side vorticity and the right hand side uh, energy transfer of close to the dissipative range. And so it seems that uh, this, the, these two quantities they look correlated, but they are not perfectly identical, of course. So first, yeah, we don't really we can't really tell. They look they seem correlated, but not so much. And so I can do the same on a, on a slice on the DNS. Uh, so it's almost uh, the same interpretation that we have here. Uh, so there are spots where both of them are lit and uh, spots where we only have vorticity and not the other one. So we can't really tell, but that's the first correlation. And to be a bit more precise about that, uh, we can compute joint PDFs. So, we, since we can look at experiments and DNS and scales of energy transfer inside the dissipative range or the initial range, here you have four plots. And so uh, you see on the, on the top here, you have the experimental ones. And uh, the, the size of the statistical data set on the experiments is smaller than in the DNS. So we only have access to a lesser point. So we see that uh, it's very restricted in, uh, in values here than compared to the DNS. But if you look at the small zooms here, uh, they kind of agree. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a, a good results. But there, there is something very interesting we see in the DNS is that uh, we have a very, very strong tail that is rather rare, very, very rare. So it's 10 to the point of five probability of very strong events of vorticity and energy transfers at almost every scale. So uh, this is a, an interesting finding and uh, we, we haven't found them in the experiment. So it's kind of, uh, yeah, we can wonder that maybe it's the size of the, of the data sets or something else because to check that we've tried to locate those points to understand a bit more where do they come from. So uh, I've, I'm gonna put a threshold here on, on this uh, PDF. And I'm going to locate the points that corresponds to uh, this tail that uh, I see uh, here on very strong events of vorticity and energy transfer. And so where are those points? So here it's the positions of the points inside the, the DNS. And the, the color is just the Z axis. So if it's 
plus or minus one, then you're inside the, the turbines. Uh, and so what we see is that uh, these points, um, they are not in the middle of the tank. They are either close to the impellers or close to the walls at mid height. And so it's kind of normal that we don't see them in the experiments because all the experimental measurements were done uh, at the middle of the tank, in a very, most of them in a, in a very small uh, parallelepipedum. So uh, we don't see those points. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's kind of logical. And um, another th very interesting thing is that if you look at the main flow inside the, the cylinder here, we have a very strong shear layer at, the, at, the, at mid height, uh, so kind of here. And so these very strong points are at mid height in the shear layer and close to the boundary. And so uh, I think uh, we could relate something by, uh, with the work of uh, Lu and Hu, uh, because they studied potential singular solutions of 3D Euler uh, axisymmetric solutions, and they found that they should be uh, in the shear layer and close to the boundary. So uh, yes, so in the shear layer of, of the flow, and that's what we cover here. So uh, even if we are doing navier stokes not, not earlier, and if we take the low viscosity limit, then maybe there is there are strong events uh, at this location. So it's a very interesting point. And so one other thing we can do that uh, is also interesting is that we can use the PDFs I've just shown you to compute conditional averages. So I've shown you only a few scales before, but uh, we've computed a lot of scales on the data sets, so uh, we can compute the uh, conditional averages of expected energy transfer conditioned on the value of, of, of the norm of the vorticity. And we found uh, two uh, main uh, scaling laws. So the, the first one is uh, most uh, evident. So in the, in, in the dissipative range, uh, we find that the expected value of the conditioned energy transfer goes like uh, the norm of the vorticity to the square because uh, so this is an experiment and you have two dns here uh, two dns le uh, different length here so we have a, a linear behavior uh, on in sorry in, in omega square here uh, so this is a very rather solid law and uh, in the inertial range uh, especially if you look at the dns points uh, then we reach a plateau and it seems that the the, the expected value of the in, interscale transfer, the, the energy transfer, uh, is rather independent. And uh, here you have some experiments, and these three here are numerical simulations. And so why is this very interesting? It's because if you try to look at the particular scaling, just give a, a holder exponent for, uh, for, this, uh, for the regularity of the, of the function of the velocity field, then uh, if we have this holder exponent h, then the, the wavelet uh, increment should go like L to the power H. And so if you compute the norm of the vorticity, it should be like L to the power H minus one. And the energy transfer using the formula I just gave you earlier, it's L to the power three H minus one. And something kind of nice and, inter and yeah, you, you, I've been wondering about that a lot is that if you take uh, this relationship that we found in the dissipative range, then you get uh, H minus one. So it should be a very non-regular uh, velocity field, so very, very rough. Um, so yes, so it seems that we, we deal with very, very strong events uh, over here. And so now we are going to try to answer the questions uh, I, I asked earlier. So of course, the flow is not self-similar. Everybody kind of knew that with structured functions uh, even before this talk. But uh, here to answer more precisely the work of uh, Bachelor and Townsend is that both of the, both phenomenon that they proposed, the postulate are linked with the phenomenon of intermittency, uh, energy transfers, and vorticity. So it's not only one of them; it seems to be the, the both uh, the two of them combined. And uh, so, if we want to look deeper into the links uh, between them, uh, so they are correlated, but not so much. We yeah. I can't really tell uh, which one is the, the first, of, if there is one, or if there is, or if the first one, or it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. And so all the fluctuations uh, in the energy transfers are also very important. So keep in mind that uh, your data should be very, very well resolved so that your statistics uh, are not uh, impacted by the low resolution you get, you use in your data. 
And so I would like to thank, yes, my, my PhD supervisors, uh, Caroline Lor and Berenger de Brühl, all the experimentators that uh, were able to get this uh, PID experiments and measurements in uh, Sierra Saclay and LMFL Lille, and also Jean-Luc Guermont and Loïc Capanera that helped me for the, with the DNS. And yes, uh, thank you for your attention. I would be happy to take questions. Thank you. Very nice talk. Very interesting. So whilst we're, uh, we're asking, waiting for some other questions, I have a question about when you showed where where these things were correlating, you had this nice picture. Yes. Um, and it, it's it was it was very clear. You could almost see the side the 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 yeah signal like the blue one. It's almost like you can see a signature of the blades in yes. the uh, in the bottom. So this is presumably where energy is being injected and vorticity is being injected into the flow. Is that right? That, that, yes, yes, uh, yes. Yes, because the, the only way we, we inject energy inside this, uh, this flow is by it's a moving boundary. So the impellers are rotating and that's the moving boundary that injects energy inside the flow. Yeah, okay. And, that, and that's why they're so well correlated. Is that right? Yes, yes, and, yes. That's why. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. Thanks for your talk. Can you comment on how appropriate a von Kármán flow, not isotropic or homogeneous, is for testing the predictions of K41? Okay, so yes, of course, yes. So this is not uh, isotropic, it's not homogeneous, but so uh, what I can comment here is that uh, if, if, you, if you take the whole flow, then yeah, it's, it's not. Uh, if, if you just focus uh, on measurements uh, in the central region uh, on a small uh, rectangle, then uh, it looks like fully developed turbulence. And uh, when you filter out on scales that uh, don't take into account the, the main uh, circulations, then it's rather close to uh, isotropic homogeneous turbulence. Okay, yeah, thank you. So another question, which is, you focus on vorticity and entropy as a quantity for conditional sampling. But would you expect similar results with respect to intermittency behavior using strain rate or dissipation instead? Uh, if not, why not? Uh, yes, uh, we, could, we could focus on the on strain rate. Um, uh, why did we focus on vorticity? It's more, um, I would say, uh, because it's um, a yeah, very well used quantity in the surveillance community. Um, yes, that, that would be interesting to look at these uh, condition statistics on uh, other points, on other things like strain rates or dissipation, I agree. Yeah, okay. But do you think it would uh, change anything or you don't know? Um, I'm, I feel like it should be rather consistent, but uh, I'm, I'm not, I, can, I can be sure. Sure, sure. Okay, this is a question from left field is, would combustion affect the occurrence of intermittency in turbulent reactive flows? Oh, so very interesting. So I, I, um, I'm, I'm sure it would affect in some way, but uh, I'm, I'm really not an expert in the, in the combustion uh, phenomenon. So uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, if, of course, uh, with com just combustion, you, you should, insert energies uh, at a different way. So it will impact, of course, the energy transfer. So uh, it's, I'm sure it will affect it some way. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, a smart answer. I'm sure it will affect it in some way. I think that's uh... <laughs> so. So uh, Jonathan has, has said, can I pick up on your answer to uh, Facundo Cabrera? It looks like omega and D are large in magnitude away from the center of the device where you have isotropic homogeneous flow. If you condition on being in the central region, how do the results hold up? Uh, so uh, as, as, as you've seen here, uh, so, so these points, it, 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 these ones are, are not in the central region. So if we look only close to the central region, then uh, we will uh, rather get uh, those uh, uh, I don't, I'm not sure, but uh, I, we won't get these points that are not in the central region. But one thing that can hold is this behavior, because uh, here you see uh, the, the open symbols. Uh, they are all experimental measurements. So the, the big circles, uh, field circles are DNS, and the open symbol are 
the, the, just the experiments. And so the experiments, these ones are just in the center of the tank. And, and we still find, uh, for instance, these relationships that are uh, still true, especially in the dissipative range, the, the linear behavior between the two of them. Uh, I mean, the expected value of the energy transfer is goes like omega square. So this is also true uh, if you only look at uh, the central region. Okay, that's good. Um, perhaps a final question from Praveen. What specific effects are there because you're modeling the impeller blades? Can you expect the same kind of results in the absence of blades if you just have rotating disks? Wait, so I, uh, for instance, here uh, you have, uh, the, so the, the boundary, the walls are not moving, only the impellers. So um, here you have, uh, the fact that the flow is rotating while the wall is is uh, not rotating and and we still have those points here so uh, even if you force uh, the flow a different way maybe you will lose the impellers but uh, you will keep uh, i think uh, what's going on uh, at mid height uh, in the shear layer close to the boundary that you have a, a rotating flow with a shear layer and a, a fixed boundary so either if you so I think that what, what's happening right here uh, at, the, at the boundary would still uh, be here uh, if you force the flow with a different forcing method. Okay. Um, okay, this really is the last question. So thanks for the nice talk. A follow-up question to the isotropic case. If you consider a rectangle inside your domain, are you able to observe a direct scale-to-scale -scale energy flux over some scales? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, because so that's <laughs> that's that's uh, there is kind of a trick here that is more for the experimentalist. So if you look carefully, uh, I've shown you there are lots of experiments, and so. Uh, because of for optical reasons, the, the, the area is fixed uh, in terms of, uh, of optical measurements. If you go in the lab, then the, it's fixed. But uh, there is a trick here, as you see that the, the Reynolds number is variating a lot from 6 10 to the power 3 to 3 10 to the power 5. And so one way we can uh, go through scales in terms of L over eta is by having a, a fixed measurement setup and you just make eta vary by uh, switching the Reynolds number or the speed of the rotating uh, measurements of, of the impeller. So, so that's why you have so many uh, experiments here and only one DNS is because to go through the scales, uh, it's the same geometry, but uh, by switching the Reynolds number, we're gonna look at different eta. And at least when we vary L over eta for the experiments, in fact, we vary more, more eta than L. And in the DNS, it's more L than eta. <laughs>